And thank you all. Somebody noticed the original slide and they said drizzle talk. And, I, and they said, but why did you change the title for this conference? Because this conference will let me use more interesting names than other conferences will. So, so all of this started uh, in truth about a few years ago. Um, a few years ago, we were working on what was the 5.0 tree for MySQL. And that's the big tree where we added views, store procedures, a bunch of ANSI features, tried to go closer to the SQL standard and pick up some features. Uh, in the process that a whole certain set of people had been saying, yes, you really need this. And when we started going into the tree and started understanding things, you know, we're trying to take pieces out and we have to change other pieces, components around. And so, of course, while we're doing this, we're at the same time, we're going to conferences and we're saying, hey, this is what we're doing for the next version. And one of our first things we noticed uh, when we were going into 5.0 was when we were actually at uh, O'Reilly's Open Source Conference. And there was a, we had gotten a talk on, uh, you know, MySQL's march towards the ANSI standard. And we go into the room, and it's the, MySQL talks are generally really, really well attended at OzCon. So we can usually fill a, a room with 100, no problem. But we go into the room, and there's like 20 people in the room, and that's it. That's all that was there. There's like 20, maybe a few more than that, but that's, that is it. And one of, our talk, one of our speakers went up and started giving this very long talk about this is what we're going towards ANSI compliance and blah, blah, this and blah, blah, that. And at the very end of it, you know, we said, well, are there any questions? And nobody had any questions throughout the room. You know, and then so I kind of stood up and said, how many of you all actually care if we ever become ANSI compatible? And there's one guy who raised his hand and I was like, why do you care? And he goes, Oh, I just care about ANSI compliance. I'm from Oracle. Uh, I don't really actually care at all about you all, but I'm just here to listen. And it's like, oh, great. So this was kind of a, a beginning of a, of, of a set of thoughts I was having at the time, asking myself, are we actually going down the right road? Is this what the user base wants? Or has this been implied to us by, you know, picking up a, a certain trying to go after a set of customers we never had before? Really, what was kind of the logic in the releases? So like I said, 2005 OzCon, we had one person who cared about the entire 5.0 feature set being ANSI compliant. The next real big trick came up uh, in a customer advisory board in 2005. So a customer advisory board is where a company tends to bring in a lot of the you know, higher paying or more interesting customers into a room and say, hey, this is what our roadmap is. These are the things we're doing. And so we go through and we pitch, this is the roadmap, and we're adding these features and that features and all this other stuff. And, you know, at the end of this, we started getting questions and feedback from the customer, advi customer advisory board. And so at the same time, I'd ask, you know, all the stuff that we're doing for 5.0, you know, can you tell me which of you all are actually interested in any of this? And half the room raised their hand. But what was interesting was, was what half of the room raised their hand. The half of the room that raised their hand were the people who took MySQL and embedded it in their products. Okay, they're doing that because what they're trying to do is skip out on Oracle license fees because the, the licensing of MySQL is about 10% of what actually you would find uh, going on uh, inside of, you know, if you went to your local Oracle rep. So these are the guys that are just basically after a cheaper deal. So they're always kind of pretty much trying to find the cheapest database to go down to the cheaper deal. The other half of the room were the Googles and the Yahoos and everybody else like that. And they were pretty much along the lines of, we just would like you to be faster. We're not very interested, actually, in any more additional features. If you want to add features, that's fine. But all of the features you add, we believe, are costing us in performance, and it's making the product too complex. We don't want all of this stuff here. We want less features. Please don't keep adding features. And it was a little bit of a wake-up call at the same time to realize that you know, the user base on one side uh, while I definitely need a product, but the user base that tends to actually fuel our growth really didn't actually care at all about what we had done in 5.0. To them, this was a, a kind of a step back, if anything. Um, so this kind of got us all thinking about this. Um, and it kind of gave along the lines of have we really been thinking about in the past? And by that, I mean, where had the product been going? MySQL had been around as a database even before we called it MySQL's Unireg. We inherited lots of Unireg's tricks and pieces about it. And it was a small little embedded database that ran on DOS and could run on Amiga and everything else. And when we started thinking about this, we were like, well, you know, all that support for all these old operating systems is costing us a lot of code. And in all that more code that we keep having to maintain, well, that means the developer has to wrap their brain around it. You know, if the developer has to wrap their brain around a POSIX interface, that's one thing. Developer has to then also figure out, like, uh, so I'm also supposed to keep this thing running on an Amiga? You know, I think one of the, the stories we had had to even get somebody to drop a machine off the support list involving calling a Swede to go to a machine rack in Sweden, pull the machine out of the rack, stick it out in the snow, 
drop a, a gasoline on it and set it on fire because that was the only way we could actually get out of supporting that platform. Because as long as that machine existed, somebody kept thinking that we had to support it. So this came up with the master plan. About a year ago in time, we sat back and said, well, maybe we should actually look at maybe splitting the code trunk again. Because maybe this other user base, the Yahoo's, the Google's, the world, if they're trying to tell us something that they don't actually care about our roadmap at all, and all of these guys have some similar, similar ideas. So back in April, uh, we actually came up with a master plan. It was me and a few other people internally. And we said, let's actually fork the product. And this is a pretty dramatic thing, because internally you got people asking yourself, what do you mean you're going to fork the product? Well, we're going to fork the product. We're going to take the product and we're going to see what would happen if we started removing features and we started going down a different path. What exactly does that mean? So we came up with a master plan. Part of the master plan was we wanted to rethink everything. Go back into the code and ask ourselves what made sense and what didn't make sense. Things that made sense 10 years ago may no longer make sense. When we were only stuck with a MyISAM engine, there were designs that we just couldn't get past. There is no way with a MyISAM engine to have a database that can really be ACID compliant. But what we did know is, is that of what our users had really wanted is, really, users don't really want us to allow them to insert bad data and let it stick in the table. And they don't want us to corrupt their data either. And that was something that was, with the original database, we couldn't prevent that in the design. But if we went back and started rethinking everything, we could. We also had to assume not everything was bad. You know, the basic SQL language that we tend to have in the database, you know, that wasn't bad. People don't want to port their applications. They want us to hit some 99% compatibility going forward. So it's not like we can actually say, like, let's throw out SQL and go to some design, like, say, where CouchDB has or the hypertables or anything like that. Users still want to be able to run their applications. We can't be so radically different that we basically become something that is not compatible with where we've been. So we also had to figure out something else. We had to focus. Like I said in the early discussion, we figured out that the embedded players, the people who wanted to embed us, really just need a cheaper Oracle. That's all they're after. So they want a cheaper Oracle, they're embedding their product. But for instance, the web hosting groups, um, everything like that, all those people, they don't actually care about Oracle compliance. To them, the, the world they grew up in involves something like a MySQL or a Postgres, and for the most part, they're using very basic SQL syntax, not very advanced stuff. So we had to say, let's actually drop some things. So we dropped ERP, all the 90s style uh, design for applications where you built giant store procedures inside your database. Let's just drop that entire way of thinking. We're going to drop support for store procedures. Yeah, we added them. We also know that people aren't using them. And we know that in the big web shops, nobody's using them. So let's just drop that stuff all again. Uh, let's drop data warehousing. At the time, we know that building a database or a modern database that involves doing data warehousing is very different than building a database which is actually focused for the web. I mean, all of the, the cool, neat things that involve data warehousing today really, frankly, are MapReduce stuff, and it's going towards Hadoop anyway. Even if you look at where the ma major database vendors are, they're going in a different direction. We can't design the database to be one thing for all worlds. Um, we also decided to drop analytics. Analytics at this point, we're only so, so good at it. Uh, we don't have most of the OLAP features people expect anyway, so let's just drop even being concerned about analytics right now. So what we did is we decided to actually focus on web applications, because we're asking ourselves, what is our bread and butter? The answer is, is that it is web applications that we get used for. So, uh, you know, and this also brought some other things up. You know, MySQL today works up to about a four-core machine. If you've got any more than four cores in the machine, we knew something. Uh, we know that it won't work beyond that. So we have to ask ourselves, if we're going to target the future, do we actually care about anybody who's sitting on a 32-bit machine? Do we actually care about anybody who's got anything less than four cores? Because the answer is, we don't see that stuff anymore. We so rarely see that stuff. And trying to keep support for, oh, well, we need to make sure 32-bit works here, but 64-bit here. Databases are one of the rare applications where 64-bit versus 32-bit makes a lot of difference in your design and a lot of difference in the way you're thinking about it. And it's one of the rare places where that's actually the case. So one of the things is, so what are we going to look at? Are we going to look at 64 core? No, we're not going to look at 64, uh, sorry, 16, we're going to look at 16 cores. We're going to find the largest machines we can get our hands on, and we're going to target those. The other thing we start asking ourselves is, really, what is the domain of data that people actually uh, are looking at? The entire Library of Congress and Word is actually only 26 terabytes. There are so many large websites out there today that are actually only running on about 10 gigabytes. You know, people right now are talking about, you know, how do we go out into petabytes of data? 
Maybe we don't actually try to build a database that works on petabytes of data on a single host or even on a set of hosts. What we're more interested in is how do we actually work on a, set, on a data set size that is really accurately what people are using. And like I said, one of the things we have to think about is there's a lot of RAM out there. We have all these hacks in MySQL to work and try to be very performant if you're under two gigs of RAM or we can run, for instance, you know, in a, ha you know, in a half gig of RAM or smaller. We don't see that stuff anymore. Why well, try to actually keep all this code around to optimize for environments that, frankly, we just don't see? If we don't see it, let's actually not touch it. So what we've been doing is we've been going through and stripping out anything that was actually like whole sections of code that were for, well, in case this user is under this amount of memory, we should be able to run in that environment. You know, we're trying to target machines instead that are in the mini uh, gigabyte range. We're not looking at the under gigabyte, you know, under one gigabyte, under two gigabyte ranges anymore. Um, one of the other things we had to look at was actually was the design of the code. MySQL had been built as a monolithic design. Basically, the whole big thing, there's about two or three of us that know it end to end. It's very, it's very large, and we can understand that. But that's only two or three of us. The larger the code had been getting, the less ability for people to come into the code and actually understand the code. Also, the problem that we learned from the design from all of this was that you couldn't touch one little piece of code and then hope to God that the other side of the system would still work. Uh, we were uh, working on refactoring out the, the replication system and pulling that out, and I found that somewhere in the middle of the optimizer, there were three calls that made calls into the replication code that then suddenly made code back out into the C client driver. I mean, that stuff is impossible. There was no maintenance of any kind of APIs. There was no maintenance of actually making sure that the code was structured around interfaces internally. And the same token, how do we take that stuff and then pull it out? Because we can put whole features in there that, frankly, nobody wants. An example, we see cases now where many people are actually using a combination of, say, MySQL and Memcached and are no longer using replication. They've just skipped out using replication at all, and they're just using Memcached as their front end. Does somebody actually want the whole, the whole bottleneck of code that exists for replication actually inside their server at that point? The replication code requires the storage engine to do a bunch of two-phase commits. Um, that stuff actually slows down the server. If we rip that entire layer out and make it a module, that means you don't have to put it in if you don't want it. And for web shops who are trying to you know, pull, pull a little more performance out of things, this makes a big difference. So we've made new rules. In the microkernel now, we don't allow any more new code into the main kernel. If you want to write a new feature, what you have to do is you have to define the point of where we can enter it into the server, and then you have to remove enough code so that your entire balance of code for that new interface is offset. So no more, no more new code. You want to put in a plug-in interface, you've got to refactor the code down enough to where we've moved that plug -in inter so that plug-in interface does not increase the total line count. We want line count only increases out in the actual modules, less code. Other big thing we look at, multi-core, uh, no new locks. Today, we've got, I think we're down to about a quarter of the locks MySQL calls on any given queries. Um, we know that we can no longer solve problems actually just putting locks around things. Uh, MySQL was originally designed uh, in an environment where it was really only thinking about one processor. It had one processor and all these given threads. But the problem is that when you run into, you know, you start running out to multi-core, you can't have any more 2,000 threads. That just doesn't work. The thread problem, you can't have locks around everything. That breaks everything. We have to find ways of removing all the locks in the server. Because we know that what? How many years away is a 256 core machine? It's not that far off in a single host. And we know that lock solutions won't work in those. And, you know, it's one of those things people say, oh, well, we fixed it by we put a p-thread lock. We fixed it by putting a rewrite lock around it. But the answer is none of that stuff actually works in scale. Message busing is the only way we've found to actually solve on this. And the other thing we decided is, for instance, in MySQL, there are certain caches so that it can save on calling malloc. So certain objects are actually kept in these caches so that you never have to call malloc. Here's the thing, though. Malloc itself is multi-threaded most of the time nowadays. Um, the cost of going in to these rotating buffers to pull these objects out just so we can save on the malloc call has turned out to actually be detrimental because that one set of single locks in there to rotate in to get, you, to get the object back out is too expensive. It's cheaper to burn now a little bit more memory, create new objects per instance uh, of a given thread pool, and just leave it inside that thread pool to be used because inside thread pool, no locks required. So we'll burn more memory, but on the same hand, we'll actually save in performance. Um, ASIC compliant is transactional. 
Um, this was something MySQL never was. We've never actually were an ACID compliant database. That's something we never actually made the, made the decision to do. So we had a debate. Do, is that really what users want? And I think the answer we came back was, yeah, users want it. What do users want? Users want the ability that if they insert their data, that the data doesn't get corrupted. If I insert, for instance, some timestamp, you want that timestamp to either be a valid timestamp or you want us to eject that as an error and no longer allow you to just insert in the database and change the value to 000. Uh, that's what we call a gotcha. And what we're trying to do is actually remove those sets of gotchas in it. Um, at the same time, we know that in deployment environments, the environment is transactional. It's not, people don't tend to use my ISAM. The only time they tend to use my ISAM is when they don't know better. It's the default engine. But at the same time, we know that anyone who generally reads the you know, first chapters of a sub books changes that to actually being NODB. So we've changed the default engine into being a transactional engine, because that's what we know people are actually using. And at the same time, this actually creates for us a whole new set of you know, issues. We've never actually tested the entire server as a transactional server. So we've been going through and fixing literally hundreds of bugs that we didn't know existed because we've never ran the database as a transactional uh, database. So, like I said, InnoDB is our default engine. And at the same time, it's actually forced up the other guys, Maria, PBXT, and others who are writing transactional engines, because they know that right now we've raised the bar as to what they have to do to actually get themselves as the default engine. So, like I said, we've removed a few things. We've removed stored procedures, we removed views, we removed triggers. We have no query cache anymore which has actually turned out interesting in some cases. We may, though, stored procedures. Some uh, developers at Google have been working on actually creating a new type of stored procedure interface, which would not be a traditional stored procedure. It's not like you type in a bunch of SQL and do it. It would basically be something uh, much more like a Tomcat running right next to side the database that could execute queries faster inside of the database. So something like that. That's a more modern approach than, say, designing these giant stored procedures in some kind of proprietary language. Um, things we've learned. Views themselves are actually really useful, but our initial implementation of them required them to always be materialized. But we found that people do want views, they just don't want them materialized. So now we're going back in and trying to decide what sets of views can we design and operate for where we don't have to materialize the data set from that, because that's actually the real thing that individuals were interested in. Triggers, no, but callbacks. You know, we had heard asking people, well, okay, somebody would come up and say, well, but I really need triggers. So, because we implemented X for doing this, and, you know, now that MySQL had them, and, well, we've been trying a drizzle, and it's all nice and sexy and faster, and that's all good, but I need the, the trigger. And then what we found out, though, is I said, well, what are you actually using the trigger for? And he goes, well, we have these DNS servers that we ping when we update data. And when we started this, you know, asking users about this, we found out that the old model of using a trigger to, you know, do some kind of provide, some kind of relational integrity back end really wasn't what people were using. They just were actually putting in functions in these things so they could make callbacks out to actually cause caching, you know, to block cache servers, DNS servers, whatever else. They were using the database as the trigger point for this stuff. Callbacks, we can actually design and write them in C, and we can make them super fast. And so the overhead cost or trigger doesn't exist. Instead, we can actually have callbacks. Prepared statements are actually out. Um, this one was a little bit of a, an interesting uh, kind of religious thing, because most people don't realize today about how MySQL or even how databases work with prepared statements anyway. They have these kind of bad assumptions on how they work. In a prepared statement today, people assume that what? They take their SQL query, they send it over to the database, and the database is keeping some kind of fancy execution plan, saves on the, par, saves on the parse tree. That's actually not true. And in the MySQL world, the prepared statement API never worked in the first place. Um, people were like, well, but I've been using prepared, statement, I, prepared statements. Well, it turns out that everyone's not aware of this, but all the driver guys realized ages ago it didn't work and just disabled it and emulated it in the drivers. So when we removed it from the server, People are like, but you're removing prepared statements. I'm like, yeah, but you're not using them anyway. You just don't know that. I know it was on a feature list one year, but it really never got used. Um, so what we did, though, is when we started looking back at prepared statements, we had to say, well, these were designed, the whole idea of this stuff came back in the 80s. You know, the idea that we're going to save on a parser and on an execution path. But things have actually changed uh, in our worlds. So what we've done instead is we've said, okay, so what do people really want? People want less execution time to occur on the database. So what we've looked at actually doing is, is that you can actually send in a statement, and we will send back that statement back as a serialized representation of what that is that we can then bypass many layers inside of our stack internally on. 
So the goal is we send you back a representation of what the actual execution is, and whenever you need to execute that, you send that to us. It means that there's no giant global SGA sitting inside the database around prepared statements. It means that you, know, you can't actually blow the memory stack in the database because it's going to push these things out because it can only have so many. But instead, we'll actually put these instead in a way that you as the client have them. So we'll move the processing time back out to the client. It costs us a little bit of memory, maybe a K on each connection. But that's it. And if you consider generally the entire message that's being sent anyway, a K of memory is not that much. What are we going to call them? Uh, you came up with limit. Got a name for them? We, we haven't yet. I, I kind of resist, huh? I, actually, we call most of this stuff protos. Uh, yeah, based off the Google's proto buffer design stuff. Um, some other things that we're actually looking at doing uh, internally. We're trying to ask ourselves the truth about this. Most of the shops out there you go to, they actually aren't using authentication against MySQL at all. What they do is they turn the database on skip grants. All of the authentication to get to access the database are up in web applications. That's where people authenticate people, not in the database. The database, half the time, either they've loaned skip grants or they have a root account that has no password. You know, I go into some of the largest shops out there and that's what exists. And even when they do have authentication, it's usually a mess. Um, it's like this is one that, that uh, Mark Callahan at Google was beating his head against the wall because he doesn't want authentication in the database. He has these big authentication servers. He wants the authentication to come from that. He doesn't want to have to keep track of two sets of user accounts. So one of the things that we actually did was, is we actually threw out authentication. And then we put in a plug-in point right there. And since then, we now have a um, PAM authentication module that was written. Because the database lives in an environment with other applications. The database isn't just sitting there by itself as this one big entity. OK, well, it was doing that in the 80s, but it's not doing that anymore. So a database needs to live within the framework of the greater environment. Either you need authentication or you don't need authentication. But if you need authentication, that means you're going to have some central, central authentication system. Whether that PAM is going to an LDAP or is going to a local user's accounts, the thing is, is that authentication directly in the database is a waste. But if you do want it, it's now actually a plug-in point. Uh, round, trip uh, round trip on serialized SQL, uh, we're trying to get that cost down, which is prepared statements. Um, we're trying to make SQL injection harder. I mean, I'm not entirely sure the brilliant idea of taking a SQL statement, putting a semicolon, and putting another statement, and allowing you to send that over the wire is the whole reason why little Bobby Tables can, you know, take out, uh, you know, his school's uh, uh, data. That was just kind of dumb. Um, so what we've now done in the new protocols, we're enveloping uh, everything. There's no way to be beat past the envelope. Is it still possible to SQL injection? It's possible for someone to rewrite your query, but it's not possible for them to write multiple queries. So if you're not escaping things, yeah, they might be able to figure out a way to change your select or your delete to either respond with more data or delete more data, but it's not any cases anymore where they can drop the table or insert values into other tables randomly any longer. That stuff's all gone now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So other things, like I said, uh, we dumping ACL. We authenticate into clouds now. Uh, we're trying to keep everything in a very simple, uh, simple model. We uh, put in PAM. We actually wanted to make sure that there's no cost for authentication. Um, this is something that's really important. If today you're using MySQL, even if you do skip grants, and you've got that on something like a more than a four core machine, that thing still passes through two uh, global pthread locks every time it goes through that. May, and if it goes through and it's uh, authenticating, actually authenticating, it can go up to four to five uh, locks just for that one case. And these are global locks. So everybody who's coming into the database who are doing anything on any query is all going through those locks. We wanted to actually make it so that if you don't want authentication, that when the module gets dropped, there are no locks. So you know, one of the things about creating, creating plugin stuff is we can move the locks into the plugin structure, which means that if you don't use that plugin, you don't have that set of locks. And we thought this was actually something kind of important. Um, authorization is coming. This is actually one where we haven't figured out how to meld a, a model yet of uh, you know, this user should have a select privilege yet and how to express that in something like PAM. Uh, right now, there's an impedance mismatch on trying to figure that out. We also started just even asking our other selves the questions like, do people really sort blobs? Um, you know, in MySQL, it's possible, for instance, to stick uh, certain sets of collations and stuff on blobs. Um, we had to ask our question, does anybody actually do this stuff? 
uh, in cases. I mean, if you've got a, a you know, if you're subbing in multi-megabyte blobs into the database, are you actually sorting on that stuff? I don't think so. Um, field types. When we went back, we asked ourselves, well, what about field types? And this is probably the biggest incompatibility we made. Um, there were many field types in MySQL that, were one thing, were either broken or were kind of strange. We'll take set operation. The set operation looks like it could be useful, except that it had such a limiting number of operations that could be done on it, and it couldn't be indexed properly. People always would say, well, I thought I used that to save space, and they discover, oh, not only it didn't save space, uh, it didn't actually help me in the end, and it turns out it wasn't indexing properly. Uh, we looked at things like, for instance, the year, the, uh, uh, let me see, it was year. We looked at things, for instance, like the three-byte uh, three int. That was one that actually always had Intel scratch in their head. They were like, so we understand this. Why do you have a three-byte int? You realize this doesn't perform well at all inside anything. I'm like, well, yeah, but somebody one day wanted to save a byte of space, so we have a three-byte int. Except that then users would do things like, oh, I want to save space. So they'd pick a medium int. And the next thing you know, you're reading, a, you know, reading something about like slash dot running out of numbers for the number of comments. It was not a brilliant idea to use a medium int there. And I think I'm the one who did it. Um, so the whole thing is we asked, what do people really care? They care about numbers. So we have integers and we have big integers. And we'd like to someday even go down to just a straight integer. People don't want to know this stuff. For instance, how many times have you wondered, well, what's the difference between a tiny blob, small blob, medium blob, large blob, and all this stuff? No, and, and Mama Blob, Papa Blob, you know, everything else that was existed in here. This was too many types. This made a big confusion on people. Like, well, they would try to optimize for this and try to optimize for that. But in truth, on a blob, you know, a maximum size blob uses four bytes. Are you really trying to store and save two bytes by picking something smaller or maybe three bytes to pick something smaller when you're shoving megabyte, you know, size objects in the database? Does it make any sense to have optimizations around a couple of bytes? Uh, on the blob? No, that never made any sense. So what we've tried to do is go back through the type system and simplify it down. So that, for instance, you know, we only have one type of float type. We don't have a, uh, a 4 byte, 8 byte, 12 byte, something like 11 byte precision, you know, doubles. We just now have an actual uh, real value. We now have a 32 bit and a 64 bit integer, because it does actually still matter. Uh, we have gotten rid of all the blob types and come up with just a single blob. And like I said, this is probably the biggest incompatibility because your create table statements have to actually change. At the same time, we removed all the zero fill stuff. So all the stuff that if you were sitting on, a, you know, sitting on some kind of a terminal and it mattered because you were doing formatting in the database for terminal expression, we assume that nobody cares about that stuff anymore. The zero fill stuff, the little numbers after it, people ask, why did I just type int paren 11 paren? What did that mean? Well, the answer meant is that I moved you 11 positions over when we are going to output. Nobody does this stuff. Databases are not supposed to be where you're formatting your data for output. So the formatting stuff we've gotten rid of. Uh, at the same time, we've actually tried to look and say, what are more modern types? Things like, can we get an actual native UUID type? That's something we've been working on. Can we have native types for IP version 4, IP version 6 types? Can we actually have real serial values in the database instead of auto increments? And this is all the stuff that we've started actually placing in. You know, let's take out some of the worthless field types. And let's put in field types that are actually pretty useful. Um, something else we looked at, things that were strange. An enum operator, if you, threw the ba if you threw a bad value in an enum, and even if you had marked the enum not null, we would still insert null. We would break ACID compliance. Now, inside of Drizzle, if you take, for instance, some value and stick that in enum, and that value is not a valid value in enum, we throw an error. So data integrity, we decided to actually make it important. Um, one of the other big things that we brought up was character sets. So when we looked at it, MySQL supports some like 20 some odd character sets uh, or more. But a lot of these character sets, frankly, nobody had actually heard about or was one little company in one little place. And we looked back at it. This was creating this huge mass of code inside the server to be able to do all these conversions and translations into something that maybe someone on the planet might care about. But when we found out that we looked back and we said, well, what's really are people actually dealing with? We know that if we're a web database, what's data uh, incoming coming as? It's coming in as UTF-8 to us. The data that's being presented and coming in is UTF-8. Why are we messing around with all these code pages, windows, character set stuff? Uh, you know, or my uncle Bob created one in the 80s. Let's support that as well. So what we did is we simplified the internals to the database by actually only deciding to support UTF-8. And this in itself has actually cut tens of thousands of lines of code at this point. And this has actually started an interesting set of questions. 
um, in other groups too. Like, what are we doing with character sets today in the open source world? I spoke at the PHP International Conference and gave this talk and explained to them, like, we went to UTF-8 because we know all this data that's coming off the web is all UTF-8. So we're going to store it in that, and we're not going to do all these translations, and we're going to save you time. Which then somebody in the back of the room at the PHP conference said, but we, didn't we just use UTF-16? And they started doing this test to figure out what the actual cost inside PHP was for using UTF-16, and then having everything backstored into UTF-8. It turns out it's decently significant. Um, the problem is finding an ICU. So what I've got Sun to do, which is almost we are like almost the point of position, is we're going to take the UTF-8 library out of Drizzle and we're going to put it under a BSD license, and everybody can use it. But inside the end, yeah, that's impossible. So the thing though is that uh, the thing though is that the the point is is that the data coming into us is UTF-8. Why are we kind of messing around with anything other than UTF-8? All that extra support bought us nothing. Uh, recycle. One of the things that we were really bad about for years is that every time we would find a problem, uh, we would say, oh, we'll write that new library ourselves. So we had kind of started writing all of these libraries ourselves. And frankly, some of them just weren't actually as good. Uh, when we took, for instance, apart the, uh, we decided to go to using the UUID library that Ted So publishes um, from, in, you know, that all the, all the open operating systems actually support. It turns out it was like 6% faster than the one our, one of our guys built. When we went and started looking at other things, our regex library was really kind of a piece of junk at the time. And we went and found PCRE and found PCRE was not only compatible with ours, but it did more. When we looked at like XML stuff, what were we doing? We had invented our own XML library. We really didn't need to invent our own XML library. So what do we do? Let's lose libxml too. It's what every other open source project uses. And the advantage is that is that when we find bugs there, we can send it back, and there's a group that's maintaining it that's not us. That's handy. <laughs> And by the way, that's a, that's a, a means there's also other groups that are looking at that. So they're finding bugs before it hits us. Reusing libraries from other people is a good thing. Um, so every case that we can right now, we drop uh, any of our own libraries and just try to find other libraries out there. And if we find that one of our libraries is unique and specific, we're actually going to try to take that and we're going to try to put it out as a separate project under a BSD license and try to get other people to use it. And that's the goal. So for anything that we know, we're going to push it out there and try to get other adoption for it. Um, other things like uh, Google's proto buffers, for instance. We looked for a way of actually serializing objects inside the server. And at the time, we have kind of our own libraries to do this and kind of not, but we needed something. We found that Google had published proto buffers, and we looked at the library and said, this is awesome. But the problem was, the license was Apache. What's the problem with Apache? We get into all of these damn problems with linking it with GPL. You know, people come up. So we actually went back to Google and said, you have an awesome library, and we really appreciate that, and we so cannot use it. And uh, they said, what do you mean? We put it on Apache, and we had to say, you put it on Apache license, you limit it from every, any GPL product uh, being able to use it. Within about 24 hours, they changed the license on it from Apache to BSD for us, and we used it. Which, by the way, was interesting because another group, the group at Facebook, had actually published a very similar library and had sent, hey, why don't you use our library? But they had actually donated over to the SF, and the SF wouldn't let them take it out of that and put it back in a BSD for us to use it. So we, could, we, couldn't, even op we couldn't even take a look at their uh, library because we can't compile against it, guys. The license is incompatible. So this is something we... Uh, have been interesting. We've also been taking a look at, we looked at ICU, we found out that ICU was too, way too damn slow. Uh, Postgres had actually done a, a bunch of work on that, and we just found out that thing's just too damn slow to even be useful. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's too bad for a day. It's not good enough for a database. That was the, that was the problem. The, uh, we, were try we decided to go look at Libatomic Ops. We had this entire uh, uh, atomics operation library uh, that, was written inside of, uh, that was written inside by some of our internal people. And frankly, when we started doing uh, little benchmarks on it, we found it wasn't very good. Libatomic Ops is a library that is actually mostly published out of HP. Um, and it's, uh, basically, it takes all the given processors out there uh, and gives you atomic operations uh, for all those processors. So if you need your compare and swap, it's a great little library for that. Um, we, looked at, we looked at, and we're still looking at the Intel Building Blocks library. They've taken a bunch of really kind of common, uh, common problem sets, hash tables, vectors, and have actually parallelized those, uh, written key pieces in assembler where they needed to, and have been publishing the, the uh, Intel Building Blocks library. Uh, and we've started trying to work with them, which is interesting because we know more about how to do um, parallel I.O. 
uh, than they do. They're very good at doing parallel operations and knowing how to take things like hash tables and vectors. But when it gets down to, hey, how do we make the best use out of, you know, uh, for instance, uh, you know, rotating across a, a given uh, file descriptor, we have a lot better knowledge than they do about that kind of stuff. So that's been actually kind of some uh, uh, good relationship back and forth stuff. So maintenance also matters. Um, one of the things is that MySQL was originally written in C, and then it kind of added some C++ code. And then it kind of, some people still wrote in C, and some people wrote in C++. And it was actually a nightmare internally, because you never knew, like, oh, look, that new feature. What language did they write that in? Oh, this one was written entirely in C. There was no code pattern to the actual way the way it was described. It was up to an individual developer. Um, a few things that we decided. One, uh, internal types, we'd moved to C99 types. Um, one thing is, we had declared our own types, like uint, ulong, all this other stuff that we had declared as our own specific kind of specialized types. We just moved to the standard int types, which actually bought us a lot because a number of libraries were suddenly able to find out, like, oh, you meant this. Do you know you have a problem here on this machine here? We also went to explicitly typing around 32-bit and 64-bit integers. So no more trying to use longs and trying to optimize for a given platform. All that stuff just led to a bunch of, pro uh, to a bunch of bugs. Uh, on the same token, uh, when we looked at it, some of our internal stuff, when originally MySQL was written, POSIX wasn't really very well defined. But nowadays, so what we've done is we started removing every place where we had written our own uh, basically portable runtime library to, to go to premium platforms. We've just started removing those and actually just going to straight POSIX based ones. Um, why should we keep around a portable library when it turns out that most platforms are just good? And, you know, there's interesting things you pick up. If you move to the more IP version 6 stuff, that stuff compiles on Windows or compiles on a POSIX system without actually changing any code. That's kind of cool because usually, for instance, that network library stuff is usually one of the pains when you go back and forth between platforms. Uh, we moved to trying to actually publish stuff in package libs so that, you know, if somebody's writing an application that needs to publish, uh, compile against Drizzle, that they can actually very easily go into their configure AC, drop in a single rule, and then we actually concentrate on giving them a good rule set um, for their uh, application. Um, for years, we always would not allow uh, the standard template library uh, code to be used in the database. But what we have know is that where what the STL used to be very slow, the STL nowadays is actually pretty fast. It's good code. We, keep, we try this every so often, benchmarking it, and we found that the STL now is very acceptable. So we had previous misconceptions based on years ago on a library that didn't perform very well that, frankly, nowadays actually performs very well. This is part of rethinking what we're doing. Should we be using the STL? And the answer actually keeps turning out yes. Um, like I said, we went moved from C++ to C++. So we started taking the, these funny public structures we have internally that had function pointers against them and actually turning them into true objects. I am far from being a C++ bigot, but we have to go one way or the other. We actually decided to go to C++. Um, how big is all this stuff? When we started reducing down code, snapping down platforms, and actually making it smaller, Drizzle's main code base today is about 315,000 uh, lines of code. That's it. The main MySQL code base as the 6.0 alpha was 1.1 million lines of code. So sure, we don't have store procedures, views, and triggers anymore, but we sit in a much smaller uh, framework, which by the way has been interesting because MySQL for years kind of moved past the point of being able to be an embedded database for small, for small products. Suddenly we've got companies like Samsung uh, and others showing up that actually can get Drizzle now working because we're so much smaller back on sets of devices that we haven't been able to touch in years. Uh, inside their phones because our size is so small. And the cool thing about this is, uh, is they're doing the work. It's not us in the main pro project. This is something that's actually kind of keen. Okay. Uh, performance matters. We started looking at scale out stuff. We looked at optimizer, execution engine. Um, a really big thing for us has been actually, uh, MySQL's pretty much ticked off and pissed off the open source community now for years. Um, and we've tried to decide to, we needed to fix that. So we decided to move, do two things. We decided to actually kill all the internal mailing lists. There are no internal Drizzle mailing lists inside of Sun whatsoever. Um, all there is, is there's what's external out. If you want to see what our roadmap is, you want to see what our plans are, it's all available to the outside world. It's entirely transparent. We decided to take the trees, we've published those over to Launchpad. There is no question anymore is are there hidden trees somewhere or anything like that. All of the code is entirely public. We also opened up how we take contributions to the code. Um, today, all you've got to do is go to Launchpad, sign up an account, take your patch, tell us that that patch is available, and then we'll import it into the trees. If it, if, obviously, if it passes a review. Um, today, right now, uh, le we're about, about one-sixth of the engineers working on Drizzle today actually work at Sun. And as far as things go like that, 
we have today, uh, as of December, we went and did an analysis. 42 people who have been actively developing on Drizzle for the month of December, of those, 38 of that month committed code. And every month, our numbers just keep increasing. And it's been interesting internally because the number of people inside of Sun is actually decreasing because as the whole number increases, as the number increases, that percentage of Sun's actual maintenance to it. But at the same time, um, we've been bringing in far more code and trying to show people the idea that if we open it up and make ourselves entirely transparent and we brought down the, you know, brought down the, the, the barriers of entrance, they could we, bring, we could actually bring developers in. There's a big myth out there in open source usually, which is that as soon as you put a project up, that everybody jumps on the project and starts adding code in. And that's always been not the case, though people talk about it. Well, we're actually breaking that as actually being possible. I mean, the number of people that keep contributing more to the code keeps growing every day. Uh, we've actually moved all of our BuildBot network out. Anybody who wants to know if the platform's compiling can actually just connect up, add their own machine to our BuildBot network, and we'll then test against your platform from that point on. BuildBot, no BuildBot network has actually turned out to be pretty fabulous for us. Um, like I said, we moved to an entirely open source model, uh, Captain Tanzel Trees. We actually changed the concept in internally of who committers are. Committers uh, in the project now are actually janitors. People who are committing code are not writing features. People who are writing features have to go through janitors. Um, the reason why is that we don't want people wanting to come to be, get commit access because they think it's like, oh, that's the glorious star because I become this. No, if you're a feature writer, we'll publish you as a feature writer. But people who commit to the main code branch don't work on features. They're just janitors. Those are the people there. It's a very valuable job. They review code. They look at other people's code. They reject code. That's the whole goal of the committers. If you're a committer, that's what you're doing. If, you're, you, know, if you want to write features, you go write work, work on features. The two jobs are not the same. Um, other little bits of things. Uh, those who only work on their codes are not captains. Uh, we moved all the changes out to the mailing lists. So you know, we now work off a very simple plus plus uh, system as far as voting goes, as features go. Uh, we weight votes stronger towards users than towards developers. You know, we know that there's a problem that developers want to build things that users don't necessarily want in the end. So we now have a lot of DBAs actually on our mailing list who are telling us this is stuff they want, this is stuff they don't want. And we try to weight their votes higher because they're the people in the end that are actually going to be the users of this. So you know, just because a developer comes up with some crazy ass great feature, you know, if, he can't fig if the DB DBAs can't figure it out, we're probably not going to take the feature. But hey, everything's open source. We can actually publish the tree on the side. Maybe it'll grow long term. I got about eight minutes left. Uh, it's been interesting. We put up everything, the translation systems up on Launchpad. Uh, within about three months, we had about 30 plus, transla uh, 30 plus translations into different languages. So we just basically outsourced that all to a web page and allow other people to do the translations. Um, that's one that's uh, pretty marvelous. Uh, code drives, decisions, um, you know, things that we've been working on, requirements for release. The current requirements for release, all incompatible changes are completed. All tests work. New code, uh, code additions are fine. Uh, think Linux kernel for that sort of thing. Uh, this is something really important. Before in the past, we would disable tests because they weren't passing. Because, well, we got to ship it anyway. We're done with that. If it doesn't pass tests, it's not shipping. All ships, we've removed the code that even allowed people to disable tests. That's all gone at this point. Uh, innovation happens elsewhere. Uh, we've been picking up more uh, strong work from other companies. Uh, Federated X work uh, is being done by Patrick Galbraith. He's principal engineer at Lycos. Uh, Anthony Curtis from Google actually also work on this. Uh, it's basically a new federated system, which is transactional, multi-system, <coughs> integrated, performant. Because they actually need that stuff, and they actually need the feature to work. Uh, we have a new, whole new transport uh, system. It's written by Eric Day. Uh, this is basically what we call libdrizzle. It is uh, asynchronous. It's multi-protocol. It's partitionable. A lot of the logic that we learned in building Memcached's protocol, we actually pushed back into the new protocol. It's also, by the way, entirely under a BSD license. The one discussion I never want to have again is about our client library and its license. I just want you to be able to you know, connect that thing up and use it. No more discussions on licensing. So distributed query cache, this comes from Mixi. Uh, one of the researchers there, uh, Toro Masake, uh, Masake, oh, he's going to, yeah, if he ever hears this, he'll learn that I butchered his last name. Uh, it's a distributed query cache. It's not locking. It's cloud distributed. It's built into Memcached. It's entirely pluggable in the system. The old query cache had one big lock around it and absolutely destroys your performance uh, if you had that on a multi-CPU machine. It was a great feature when it was written in 2000, and it's today it absolutely kills performance. You never use the query cache. Uh, we ripped it out. As soon as we ripped it out, Mixi came back and said, but we kind of like it on our machines. But yeah, we have the same problems. 
So what they do, they're now putting researchers to go in and build a new query cache system for us, which is actually distributed. That's engineering work they're doing on their part. Uh, where are we going? You know, this was the original model when we started. And this is for about 10 years what I talked about from MySQL, which is, you know, the connection pool, query cache, parser, optimizer. Um, but we've actually started pulling these, all these pieces out as modules. And as we've done, we've come up with a number of things. One, we don't have to have the database sit on a single machine anymore. We can now actually sped out parsing all these pieces out to multiple machines. We believe that the future of actually the database is not trying to get, figure out how to be on a single machine, but how to be across many given machines. So by actually splitting, splitting out the architecture into pluggable methods, we can now take these components and say have good interfaces and put them out, on, and put them out through network, tra you know, network transports and actually use that to central core. And we can start distributing jobs out. It's actually made a whole bunch of stuff like the, how we need to do stuff in the future. Because your database, um, either your database is so small it lives on a single machine, or you've got 100 machines. And if you've got 100 machines, we have to know how to make that work going into the future. Because right now, it's a complete pain in the ass. So how do I get involved? Um, top is the Launchpad directory. Um, you just type BZR, branch, LP, drizzle. You have your entire copy of it. That points, you know, configure, make, make, install. Uh, we have a discussion list, like I said, it's discuss, uh, discuss, uh, drizzle, discuss, and we also have the free node, which is uh, pound drizzle, and there's pretty much somebody always on the planet that's actually reading that thing uh, any given days. We average about 50 some odd people nowadays, I mean, it's growing about two or three per week. So, And at this point, if you've got any questions, I believe I have like two minutes, five minutes. So, questions? So, so why won't we take in the talent patch? The reason why we won't take in the talent patch is the problem is, is that it's a piece that lives inside Samba. That's cool, but it means that it's not a revisionable project. It, it is a, a, a file and a directory and a project. If it was taken out and was put out as a library that was you know, something that then the, the package maintainers could actually say, this is it, and we could subscribe bugs back to it, then it's something. But, but I don't believe in just jumping into it and ripping it out every so often. Well, no, but it's a, a library. If we're having to, like, if we send you patches over and we have to keep tracking this thing back and forth, we have no tracking ability to do that. I don't want to just take, I don't want to take pieces of code out of other projects and then just bring it in and say, well, now it's our copy. Because inevitably, somebody's either going to change our copy and not send it back. I want to work with libraries. You know, if it's really good, and I hear generally fairly positive things about Talloc, then it should become a library as its own project so that other projects can use it. Because I know it's distributed on at least Debian as a standalone package. So I, yeah, so at least Debian actually does it. But until it's something that, you know, you can go to a web page, we know it's this version, or hell, even this set of trees is its own thing, that makes sense. But just pulling it out of a, another. We, we could do that. I mean, yeah. um, basically, the reason I haven't done this, I mean, there is talent at all. Yep. Yeah. It's just laziness in our account. Just because, you know, we, we, if that is the sole impediment for another project, it could be hosted somewhere else. Yeah, it's been interesting. We've gotten like two or three patches, incoming patches I've had to reject that have wanted to use it. And every time the incoming patch I reject it, I say, you need to go back to that, you need to go back to the summer project and get them to turn it into a, a, an actual project that we can go against. No, no, that was the funny part. It's nobody's ever jumped that far. It's like, it's like oh, crap. And then some people even keep, and some people even keep trying to submit the patch multiple times. Like I'm going to not notice it. Oh, look at that again. There it is. Ah, cherry pick. <laughs> Yeah, I also assume it's pretty much stable at this point. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the Sam Lidicott is proposing some changes. Do you guys okay. use Talent Reference at all in your patch? Uh, not yet, I think I will. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, the Talent Reference is really dodgy. Um, and it's, <laughs> it's the worst part of the API, and it's always the one that people trip over. And so there's a bit of a debate at the moment of exactly what we're going to do with Talent Reference with a bit more restrictions on it. Because the, the reference itself is fine, but then bringing to memory Talent Free on a reference doesn't give you enough information. The programmer isn't supplying enough information to the library to say which, what it should do. Should it get rid of this parent or that parent? Um, Telecom link does give enough information. And so we're looking at trying to make it so that the intent of the programmer is made clearer to the library. Um, so our main problems here with Telecom have been Telecom reference problems. Um, so they're not using it yet, that's probably good. Uh, I just do my stuff on, it was just a, a separate git tree on Samsung at all, if that's the thing, or does it have to be not on Samsung at all? 
we have to figure out something. I, it, we have to figure out something. I mean, and I could even I'd be happy to actually help with some of this so that when a user comes along and says, I'm trying to build uh, Drizzle, that there's some place they can grab a tarball that when they do the make, make, install, it goes into the right directories and they, that it's done. Because it's just, I can't ask, it's the whole thing, I can't ask Yuli a user to say, oh, by the way, go use git here, pull this file over here, because it seems always dodgy whenever an open source project makes you do something. Sure, sure. that. But, but yeah, that's something like that. pieces of it is actually has been refactoring out the, well, there's two things. On one side of it is, how do we fix the code so that more people other than about two or three of us understand the code? And that we've been very successful in. So in some cases, it's a question of how do we refactor the code down? Some of the code we removed, honestly, was just duplication. Had too many developers working on it in the last couple of years who just kept duplicating shit, not knowing the actual internals. And that was just bad design on the code part. They felt they had to do that. Um, but the kind of performance we see mainly is in the, uh, uh, the up Okay, there's a couple of performance things. Uh, one, the new, uh, to give you an idea, the new protocol, when I compared it to, like with what it takes to build the front page of Slashdot, the number of round trips uh, for Slashdot, something about 17 round trips to the database to build the front page. Uh, inside of Drizzle, those same sets of SQL uh, can be done in six. So six round trips. So that right in there is not a, that performance gain there is that we just saved a whole bunch of network I.O. Um, going back and forth, going back and forth and back and forth. Second thing that's a large one is if you're on SMP machines. We've been pulling lock after lock out of the system because the number of locks inside of MySQL is pretty much, it's impossible to figure out what the performance on an SMP machine is. Even if you fix the NODB problem, there are so many other locks that are actually locking up there that you just pretty much trash any kind of performance on any kind of machine that's got, uh, that has, you know, X number of cores in it at this point. Um, and that's been kind of our goal is to get rid of that kind of stuff. Other things, uh, the optimizer path is now faster because there's far fewer like if else, if else stuff going through it. Um, but really the bigger performance stuff I think is actually in both us being able to now use multi-core systems better and in just getting the network uh, traffic down. I mean, it, you know, performance changes people talk about, you know, um, people come with a patch and say, you know, I rewrote this line, you know, I rewrote this code here to do this faster by some micro amount and made the code completely unreadable. I'm not really that interested in those kind of patches anymore. You know, what I'm interested in more is in large changes that make real differences. You know, if you say we can make this code, you know, some micro amount faster that'll never show up on a benchmark, but we know it's faster and it's completely and utterly impossible for most people to read, I don't care about those types of changes. What I care about are the bigger changes that actually result in real performance. Which, by the way, you know, there is some, there is a, a bit of difference of opinion there. There are folks who are like, well, can't we make these three other things here? And, you know, I look at it and I say, yeah, but nobody can even figure out what the hell you did there. Um, and you can't even benchmark, you know, you can analytically prove to me that's faster, but you can't even benchmark the difference. And for something that's unbenchmarkable, I don't care. So, okay, so uh, on that note, I thank you very much, and I hope this was uh, entertaining.